Okay, hi. Um, I don't have anybody with me right now, um, but uh, go, I'm gonna go ahead and get started uh, in case some people are gonna uh, wanna look at our help session today uh, after the fact, okay? Um, so, I mean, I had planned, you know, unless some people join here and start asking some questions, I would planned really just kind of a review today. So review test one and also maybe review um, the uh, first program assignment. I had one or two things that I can maybe show um, on that again. So, um, so first was test. Um, um, I mean, everybody pretty much did fine uh, on the first test. Um, so do, I mean, just a couple of general things, general suggestions. Uh, I didn't, I, in future for the short answer questions, I might spend more time look at that more closely than I had a chance to this time um, so you know just be aware of that so a lot of people really could have used more so whenever more you know written some more um, given given some more um, support for the the conclusion they're talking about so whenever I give a question that really needs to be answered as uh, as a written response in English I mean, you know, you do need to write more than a sentence or two, usually. Um, and um, there, I, I posted some example solutions, example discussions for the questions. So there was actually three uh, of the short answer questions, um, and you got two of them at random of the three. So you can see all the all three of them, the questions and the answer here, if, if you want to review, uh, and also kind of compare what you had written down with um, the example discussion, right? So, so yeah, I mean, I would encourage you to, to try to be, you know, more verbose than next because, you know, I might, uh, if I might be pickier sometimes for, te for some tests than others, um, depending on time and the questions and things. So, you know, so things I, I, I might have like slide on this first one um, might end up getting you points lost because you're not, um, given enough of an answer or not supporting your points or conclusions well enough that kind of thing so on um, the other thing I mean, sometimes there will be also written questions that really are uh, numerical have a calculation but again you really should show like your work at least show um, uh, the, the, the steps and the calculation because if you just give me like a final number answer um, and that that number is wrong it's hard for me to get partial credit and, and these uh, written questions are worth a lot. They're worth half of the test usually. So ha half of your points being just multiple choice, true, false, which, you know, I think everybody should be able to do those because, you know, you can use the textbook. Um, um, I mean, I would encourage you to, to, to review and study beforehand because there is a time limit. So you really can't be reading the book for the first time while you're taking the test and, and you really want to do those multiple choice true false questions as fast as possible to leave you time so that you can actually uh, do some time uh, spend some time with the written questions which you know make up a significant portion of the um, uh, online test grades for this class so, and as some people found out you know I, I mostly do take these questions from our textbook, um, like the this one having to do with the two-level memory hierarchy, uh, I might have made that one up myself. I can't remember, um, but uh, definitely these other two were, were questions directly. So the one about the hypothetical 32-bit microprocessor um, with 32-bit instructions, and a few questions about that. So, so this depended on you reading about our hypothetical machine and then being able to synthesize or translate kind of what we talked about with that 16-bit machine into thinking about these sorts of questions. Um, and then the other one, um, uh, we didn't have a lot of direct stuff in the textbook, although again, this was another question at the end of chapter one, I believe. Um, but this one required you to have understood the, the stuff about um, interrupts and kind of about how, how I.O. and buses work um, at the low level to do this one. So, All right, so yeah, I'm not going to walk through these. You can read these um, um, if you want to compare or, or get more of an explanation. So, But yeah, the, the other thing, though, like... Um, 
Um, I mean, you maybe don't have to do this much discussion for each one, but uh, but yeah, like like this one, you know. Uh, I mean, this is really um, at least kind of minimal of, of kind of what you should be doing. You know, def definitely if, if there's multiple questions asked, multiple parts to a question, make certain that you explicitly address each one and you explicitly label those so I can easily find those when you're talking about part one versus part two, part three, that kind of stuff. So. All right. Um, so that was really all I had to say about the test, unless people want to ask some other questions um, here or later. No. Uh, and, and also, you know, if you had questions about the multiple choice true false, you do need to go to the test review. So I, I, I you know, I talked about that. You should be able to bring up a review of the test, your answers, and my feedback. Um, I, I, I mostly gave feedback for the short answer question, so I might have given you, although, I, again, I didn't give a lot in, in this test, so, so most, of, most of your feedback is going to be through reading my example, um, expected answers, and discussion of these, right? Uh, but I, I, I sometimes have feedback on those, and there's sometimes feedback for the multiple choice, true, false, uh, a discussion about those, or maybe where to find those in the textbook, um, uh, where, where those questions are asked, so, okay. Um, so program one was returned, um, evaluated and returned on, on Saturday, I think. Um, so again, there's also uh, some example solutions. I only posted an example solution for the hypothetical machine simulator because that, that was the only place that you really needed to add code in um, to get it working, right? Um, oops. So I had a couple of things that, um, that, that I'd like to maybe talk about on that. Um, let me go ahead and bring up the code here. So right now I've, I've got my, I'm, I'm in my one directory where I've got that solution that I posted um, in there. And, uh, Yeah, my system's being a little bit slow. I hope I don't crash again like we did for our last that, um, session. So. so I already talked a little bit about, I might be repeating myself a little bit here. Um, I, I talked about um, like running the unit tests and running the system tests before. Um, here now I can finally bring up the example solution. So let me get the um, tests open up in case we need to look at those. And let's get the uh, header file opened up and the implementation file opened up. So hopefully after this first assignment, um, you know, if you've never worked with code split across multiple files or, or with C++ code split between headers and and the CPP or the implementation file. So, so now maybe you've um, kind of seen this and kind of understand at least a little bit better what's going on. So one of the goals of this class is, is to, to get some experience with, with code that's more realistic. So, so code split across multiple files, code uni using a unit test framework, um, and, and code using an ob object-oriented design where we split the, um, the API or the definition of the class that, that's normally what goes in the header file. So like the definition of the hypothetical machine simulator class, we split that from the actual implementation, right? Um, and when you're working a multi-file project, you do that because anything that just needs to use the hypothetical machine simulator class, all it has to do is include this header file. That has all the information that you need in order to use the class. Not how it's implemented, but what the name of the class is and, and what basically what the public number function, which constitutes the public API or the public interface to using that class, right? Um, so I'm not gonna, I mean, you know, you can look through if you had questions specifically about uh, any of these functions uh, to implement. Most people either didn't get very far um, and, and again you know I expect everybody to be able to at least for this class submit a correct submission package that can be extracted so you use the make submit from our build system and, and you are using our build system 
and it can and it can compile. So I'll I'll give you the code that compiles as a starting point, and you've completed at least the first task because for probably most all of these, maybe not on the last assignment or two, but certainly for the next two assignments, I will probably be going through task one for these assignments in our help session, you know, the, the week, the, the two weeks before it's due, or at least a week and a half before it's due. So maybe starting this Wednesday or next Monday, um, I'll start going through assignment two, right? But yeah, I'll usually give you that first task. So you should be able to submit something if you just watch my help sessions or participate in the help sessions that can be extracted, compiles, runs the test and has the first task completed. If you do that, you get 50, 55, you, know, get, you get about half the points. And then everything else from that is gonna be doing the subsequent tasks. So, so keeping adding on more and more complexity till you get the full simulation um, for that week's, for, for that unit's um, um, simulation, whatever we're building. So. Um, so like I said, I mean, most, I mean, I, I had lots of people that uh, really didn't get started. Um, and I had some people still that were, were giving me something that didn't compile and run, which you didn't get any points for that. And, and some people, you know, apparently didn't know or didn't watch the help session. So they got, they, they, they give something that compiles and runs, but they hadn't implemented anything or didn't even have the first task, like initialized memory working, which I had given the full um, version of initialized memory on there. So, um, so it really is useful, if, especially if, if you need help on the program assignments to watch the help sessions and, and at least do the stuff I give you um, so you can turn on, turn in and, and get, um, you know, at least the half the grade for each of these assignments. If you, if you get half the grade, if you do all these assignments and finish the first task uh, on all these assignments, um, you will still be able to get a perfectly fine grade in this class. You know, the programming assignments are worth like 25% of the grade in total, so you'd only lose maybe a letter grade, if, as long as you're doing them all and submitting something that works and runs and, and, and has a little bit of effort shown in it. Okay, so yeah, um, but most of the people that kind of got past task one or two basically usually had pretty much everything working then, right? Um, with, with the possible exception of a bug or two. And, and I tried for anybody who was, was running, but was didn't have all the tests passing or had something that was a bug, I, I tried to debug it and um, you know give you um, a good description of, of what the problem was and what you could do to fix it um, or where to start at least. Um, so yeah, I mean, most of these, again, if you understood these and if you're correctly reusing the previous functions, you know, so, if, so the peak and the poke, um, if you just use the translate address, they're pretty simple, almost one, two liners. I could have done this all in one line, you know, so it's, it's at um, memory address and just put call the translate address in there equals value. Likewise, I could just return memory and then call translate address, you know, but I split it. It's probably a little bit more readable to split this a little bit, you know, but, but that, this is essentially almost like a one-liner. And these functions basically give you the, the basic thing you need to be able to read and, you know, do the basic uh, memory read and write that you're simulating for the hypothetical machine here. So these allow you to get values into memory and get them back out. Um, and then, you know, if you use those, uh, again, if you reuse those, um, that makes most of these, the, the fetch, not the execute, but the fetch function, and then the implementation of the specific execute, uh, like execute load, uh, beside, in, in fact, you know, you didn't, uh, the, the assignment, I have, I have some exceptions, uh, examples of exceptions, all, all these execute ones, execute load, execute store, but um, um, I don't think we tested for those, so you really didn't need these exceptions in there and that was one of the biggest tells for me that you were that some people were reusing uh, or just using the uh, past solutions you know um, if, if I saw these in there there's there nothing that forced you to have these but there's an example of doing some extra error checking uh, but besides the exception I threw in there and the, ex the error checking again all these like execute load is really just reason peak address and could be a one-liner 
So you, so you have to, whatever the instruction register is pointing to, you, you, you do, to read that out using peak, put that in the accumulator, okay? And for store, um, um, whatever the um, instruction register has, you want to you want to store the accumulator um, out into the instruction to the memory address pointed to by the instruction register, uh, the, the address part of the uh, instruction that you're currently executing, right? Which should have been decoded in the uh, execute step. I'll go, I'll go back to that real quickly here, right? But again, that's just a poke for the, for the store. Um, add is. Um, um, uh, just a peek. So again, you know, an add instruction contains the opcode and the memory address of the thing, of the location of memory you're supposed to fetch to add to the accumulator and put the result back into the accumulator. So again, if you reuse peek to what the IR address is pointing to, that'll read the value out. You can add that to what the current value is of the accumulator and save it back in. So again, it's pretty much like a one-liner except for the addition of um, some error checking that I had there and subtraction is basically the same thing. Uh, and then jump is really just um, um, changing the program. This is the example of a um, flow of control opcode or, or instruction type in our hypothetical machine that our textbook talked about. So really the, the execution of a jump is, is just taking that address, this part of the opcode, and modifying the program counter instead of modifying the accumulator like we do for the arithmetic instructions. So again, that, that was kind of pretty much like a one-liner. So the, the only kind of real complicated one that, that really needs more than like a single line or two to implement was the execute um, function. So if you followed the instructions in the assignment, um, th this one, you did have to do some error checking again. Um, I believe I specified that and had that in the unit test, maybe not, but um, you know, check that, um, after the fetch, we've got a valid instruction. So instructions can only be, be between zero and 9999. So negative instruction. So, uh, um, so anyway, it, uh, any instruction that's less than negative one or bigger than 10,000 really doesn't fit into our 16-bit machine architecture. Um, but yeah, the decode, and this was described in the assignment description, the, the decode is really, uh, the, the instruction should have been fetched as part of the, the, the fetch. So you're assuming the instruction is already an instruction register. So to decode it, you have to get that first character, the, the, the first digit, that's the actual opcode, right? And by doing an integer, integer division by a thousand, uh, that will, you know, divide by a thousand and it'll just throw away any fractional part. So, you know, if, if it's 2000 something, you would just get a two for the um, add instruction, if, if I remember that right, or, or whatever that first digit is. So, so integer division will just get that first digit. Um, and then the address is really the other three digits. So again, if you divide by a thousand, but if you take the remainder, if you're doing integer division and take the remainder, that We'll chop off that and we'll just give you the remainder. So, you know, 9999 divided modulus, remainder 1000 is just 999, right? So, anyway, that, that's, that's, that was described. That's how you um, decode it. Um, and you were supposed to automatically increment the PC, the program counter. So, you had to have an instruction in there somewhere that called the increment PC function as long as the instruction we were about to. Uh, um, implement was not the uh, a zero, like a halt instruction. And then after that, although this, this function is a little bit bigger than, than all the others, except for maybe um, initialize memory and translate address, uh, but, but the rest of that is really just kind of a big switch statement, or some people use if else statements, which is fine, but I really do encourage that uh, if you have, I mean, learn your language, so, so um, switch statement is, is directly made for this, where you have a multi-option um, uh, of, of choices to execute, right? So, and, and each one of these, like load store, needs to just call the, the sub-function to, to execute the basic thing. Right? Okay, so if, if you did that, um, so the other thing I was kind of really gonna show, I showed this a little bit and I mentioned this to some people, but if you did that, um, you should have then, you know, been able to get all of your system, uh, the unit test passing, right? So, so when you do your make test, it would 
run the new test. Um, now, some people may or, some people noticed that even though they had all their unit tests passing, they weren't getting all their system tests to pass. And I kind of want to discuss that a little bit because um, uh, you'll need to um, understand that better uh, for some of the future assignments uh, and be able to use that. So the whole purpose of, of building this um, is, I mean, it's really not really these unit tests. We, we want to end up with the actual simulation, um, and that goes into this .sim file, okay? So the unit test is really running the simulation on different um, um, programs. Um, so uh, like I've shown before, um, the simulation that's built um, is really just a command line program. So it's built um, and in all of the simulations we do for the, the units two, three, four, and five for this class, um, they'll all be of the same structure, although they might have different command line parameters. But usually they'll, they'll, they'll take a couple of different command line parameters and then they'll take one file as input, which represents the, um, the, the, the thing that we want to simulate. So it represents the data or the starting state for the simulation, right? So in this case, um, all of our simulations are um, in some files. So, you know, so you should learn how to run these by hand. So if I want to run um, the, the program three, which was part of the unit tests, um, we have to specify max cycles like 100, which is what I typically used um, in all my examples. And what that means is that if, if you have a program that's an infinite loop, um, if you didn't have like a, some way to stop it, uh, if you ran it, it would just look like the program hangs or just uh, never returns, right? So by, by, by specifying max cycles, we can say run either until you get to a no-op instruction, so you get to a halt, or, uh, or if you reach 100 cycles, go ahead and stop um, and show me the result. So, and then if I wanted to run program three or program two, so here I'm specifying a relative path name. So my, my current directory is this, uh, and then the file I want to pass in, um, you know, which is my second file, um, I can find by, by saying go to the SimFiles subdirectory and then find the, the, the program name, program2.sim. Right? And that will run it. Um, and I think as I showed last time, um, you know, for example, you could have, um, you could have checked the, um, your problem set questions. So I had simulations in here for your problem set questions. Although I think as I found out, I actually had not the, the, the problem set questions that I gave you for this. So you might've had to write your own .sim file, um, but you, know, so you could have double checked all the, the written problem set questions that we did. Um, but um, kind of what I wanted to show you on this is that um, you could have had all your tests working, but you might've found that um, Compatible with all the unit tests passing, but you might have found that, that a couple of your system tests uh, weren't passing, right? And that mostly happened because, oh, let's see, so for, for program two, oops, that I just ran, um, or I guess it's program three and four, maybe. Three, yeah. So we'll do that again. So for program three, I'll just show the last um, cycle four here. So at cycle four on, on the fetch, um, so, so no, this is the, the contents of memory, um, or let's, let's look back at, at the end of, of the previous cycle. Um, so the program counter was at 103, um, which is the next, we're going to fetch our next, next instruction from um, memory address 103, um, and the accumulator had that value, um, and this is memory here, okay? So when we do our next cycle, we f when we fetch from 103, we're gonna be getting this value 1200 into the um, instruction register, right? Um, and then notice, so 1200 means uh, opcode one, um, so that's uh, a load. Um, and then we're specifying that we want to load from memory address 200, okay? But um, um, it's not completely obvious from here, but if you look at this, uh, the, the program um, uh, three simulation, just 
open that up with a plain text editor. Um, the, the memory that we're simulating goes from memory address 100 to 200, okay? So memory address 200 um, is supposed to be illegal, so it's, it's not valid. Um, it's not within the range of the memory that we're simulating, right? So what we expect when we run the system, and this is what we actually expect and we're testing for, um, we, we expect a, an exception to be thrown so we get a runtime error, right? Um, and you should be getting um, the error from the translate address because translate address um, was where you were supposed to check um, the, the, the bounds of, of, of the memory address that you wanted to translate, right? So uh, we're expecting though to get an error message exactly of this format, right? So uh, uh, the error message has to say, you know, translate address colon memory bounds access error comma illegal reference to address colon 200 because the, the way these system tests are run um, corresponding with program 3 sim there's a program 3 result which if you look at that um, is just exactly this output including the output from all um, error messages that we're expecting right and all we do for the system test is we run the, the particular program, and then we just do a diff between the output that your program generates and the output that we consider the correct output from for running that simulation. Right? So if your output doesn't exactly match, um, you'll fail the system test, right? So the way to check that, so let me go ahead and um, close these, but, but show you what you would have seen. I'll close that one maybe, but um, let's say, I'm going to comment this out so I can um, Oops. So, we just copy that, but you know, before you knew about this, um, you know, maybe you just did um, a simple error message like, uh, I'll say, memory bounds incorrect. And that, that was it, all right? So that was the whole message for this exception. So that, that's fine. I mean, that would have passed the, um, so let's build it. And if you run, oh, uh, this is my semicolon. And if you run that, I mean, this will still pass the system test because you're throwing the exception where we're expecting, but we're not really testing if you're getting the right, um, getting the exact um, error message. Now I think about that, maybe I should add, just add that to the test. That way um, um, I can force you to get the right error message out of this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so if, if we run our test, uh, we should find that um, all the tests pass. But if we run our system tests now, I'll just run all of them by hand, by invoking, we'll see that we're failing three and four, okay? Um, so if you need to understand why you're failing a system test, this is the general procedure, right? So if I'm, I'm failing system test four, I, I can, uh, three, I can run it by hand, like I did. Um, right? And if I want to, um, so, so you notice, because I changed that, now we get the error message of memory bounds in track. But it might be hard to, to, because it could be a real bug instead of just, um, you know, the, the the uh, exception message is a little bit different, although that's the only thing. If you had all your, your unit tests passing, that was probably the only thing that could have been wrong uh, when we're doing the full system test here was, was these error messages, right? So you most likely would have had everything right, but maybe not. So you could have done something that was passing the system test, but uh, passing all the unit tests, uh, but still had a problem uh, when we ran a full sim system simulation. So probably unlikely for this assignment, but maybe not so much for some of the 
next one. Right? So anyway, if I want to, I could um, output that to a file like uh, program 03.out, right? So, so again, this, this, uh, this is command, Unix command line usage here. So doing an error like this, read notice we didn't see any output except for we saw the error messages, which I'll explain in a bit. But, but this redirected all the standard output to a file called program 03.out. So now if I look um, in my current, and it put it, that file in my current directory. So now if I look in my current directory, which was the, this assignment one solution, you'll see that there is a um, program three dot result um, uh, here, okay? Um, a lot of these others are because I was doing, doing some examples um, uh, before this class here for some other people. But, but anyway, so the one thing that I just created that I just did on this was to create an out file called program 03.out, okay? And these are just file extensions, you know, so um, in Windows, um, it, it, it kind of forces more, you know, the extension, you need to have the right program associated with it so you can open it up, but um, it's a little bit looser, so it's just by convention. Um, you know, so I can open up out files and anything. And since this is just a plain text file, I can use plain text editors to look at this. Um, so anyway, that output file has the same standard out, the, the, the same output that was being generated when we ran that, but we just redirected the file. But we didn't get the, um, the standard error, which we need to because we're testing both the standard output and the standard error. So um, you can also do this little trick. So what this does, if you put two out, that's an ampersand one. This mean two is, is representative, means the standard error. This redirects the standard error into the standard output. So the result is, is that both standard output and standard error messages get sent to the standard output and then the standard output gets redirected to this file. So now when you do that, you notice that there's no um, output um, that you see on the command line because everything, both the standard output and the standard error got redirected into this file. And so now we'll see, um, down here we've got that plus, we've now got the error messages, right? Um, and then to, to finish this up here, the, the, the system tests are really just running the simulation and doing a diff. So uh, you can do a line by line difference on plain text files using the diff tool. So if the diff between the program 03.out and the sim files, So I called those .res to be the result. So that's kind of the expected result that you're supposed to be getting from the system. So if you do a diff, it'll just show you only those lines that were incorrect, right? So if you had a lot of stuff that was incorrect, it might be difficult to see what's going wrong. In that case, you usually want to look at the very first difference um, and, and uh, concentrate on that. I mean, almost, an, uh, you know, I mean, that's kind of a general rule of thumb for me. So whenever you're having problems like compile error messages or unit tests, just look at the very first one and ignore all the others. So the very first one um, could be causing problems further on. Um, so if you fix that one, then you might fix other stuff afterwards, right? And it could be less useful to fix like the last problems or the problems in the middle because uh, those might be just um, side effects of earlier problems um, and it'll be less easy to understand than the very first problem you're seeing. So in this case, if you do a diff, you know, you, you get that it's only that one line on 131, right? Which is um, here, this meant that the, the, the first program, which is your program or my program out, output, had this on line 131 and um, the, the other, the thing we're diffing or comparing it to, the program 03 result, had this on line 131. That was the only difference between 131 lines um, in these two files here, right? So, you know, we could um, fix that back then, for example. Um, although again, I mean, it does have to exactly match. So, so if you have a spelling mistake, or even more subtly, if you have like some line space mistakes, so if I put a space before and after, even though everything else is right, So legal reference to 
address. So here, I, I won't put the extra space there. Um, and I'll even put out the, um, the address here, like, like that. So, um, oops. So even this will, will still fail, fail the system test, um, although it'll be more difficult to spot this difference. So uh, you know, if we run the program, we see, you know, and it looks pretty close to what the result is. But yeah, if we do the diff, it'll still complain about the line 131. Uh, oh no, I'm still getting memory. I'm still getting the memory bounds incorrect here. Let's see. Oh, um, because I didn't output that to, so if we take the results and put it out to an output file, um, and, and error as well, there we go. Um, so now if we look at the diff, you know, it's pretty similar, but, you know, so what I'm saying there is, I mean, even white space will kind of count for the diff here. It might cause your test fail. Although I think actually I do maybe tell it to ignore differences in white space for these system tests. So um, we'll see if that's true. So if I um, run the system tests, uh, yeah, so I probably am actually ignoring difference in spaces, but but you know, like difference in spelling though would still cause um, or, or you know other things like not having the address on there would, would definitely cause the, the system test to, to fail there. So. All right, but, but yeah, I did want everybody to kind of understand, I mean, that's really the purpose of these simulations is, is that final simulation. And, and I also kind of the reason why I put in the system test is, you know, the, you, you might be forced to actually go through and, and run the whole simulations or understand it from running the, the full simulation. Um, because uh, for some of these other um, coming up assignments, uh, there'll be other things that you'll have to do to get the system test, system, the full system test to work for some of these things, um, I believe. So. But in general, that also just is, is meant to help you kind of understand, um, you know, the, the purpose of the materials that we're going through for this class. Um, you know, so in this case, since it was kind of introductory unit, um, I, I wanted everybody to make certain they had a good solid foundation of, you know, the, the basics in theory of how a computing machine operates. You know, the ideas of the fetch execute cycle um, and other things that we didn't have in the simulation. So kind of how the memory hierarchy works and um, uh, interrupts and uh, that kind of stuff. So. Um, okay, so uh, maybe one final thing. So let me again uh, bring up the um, this assignment one sim.cpp. So I, I just want to kind of talk about that. So the, the assignment one test.cpp is used to create the, the unit test, but the assignment one sim.cpp has a main function um, that's used for the simulation executable. That 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 the, the sim, the, the executable named sim that's built for these assignments. And so this is another thing that I know a lot of people um, may not have used to have 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 run across and um, are, are not so familiar with, okay? So um, this is an example though of a command line program. So we are using um, these arguments to main, which are known as the command line arguments. So argc represents the command line argument count and argb represents the, um, uh, the actual values of the arguments, okay? Uh, so as you'll see, um, like like if you give the wrong command line arguments to a command line program like this, so if I don't give any command line arguments, it doesn't actually run the program. I actually run the program. It, um, it, it, it instead jumps to this usage of message, okay, and, and it prints out how you're actually supposed to use the program. So you're supposed to call it with sim, and then you're supposed to give two parameters, two command line arguments. Max cycles and the program dot sim there, right? Um, so basically, it does that. It, it calls the usage mission because it's, it's expecting argc, the command line argument count, to be three. Okay, so when I call the the, the program 
like this without any arguments, it actually um, gives me an argc of one because it, it counts the, the program name as one of the, the command line arguments. Okay, so, so, so here if you looked at argc, um, it would just be one. And since one is not equal to three, um, instead of trying to run the simulation, um, it um, instead calls the usage function and the usage function just prints out a usage message and exits immediately. Um, but if argc is three, that means we have exactly the, the uh, amount of arguments that we were expecting. So then we try to parse those arguments, right? So, so um, if you have arguments that you're expecting, you can try and parse them. So we're expecting, so argb is zero, since there's three, um, so again, um, for invoking the correct way to run a simulation, we would say the name of the program, uh, num the max cycles, like 100, and then the, the um, and then the name of a file that has the initial state of the simulation neuron. Okay, so these are the command line arguments, and and these are going to be separated by white space by the operating system. Uh, actually, by probably by the bash shell, but but uh, by something will separate by white space. So it considers this argv zero. So this is the argument value um, for a command line option zero, which is always going to be the name of the program, however you invoked it. This is argv1, so the first command line argument um, is, is the value after we separate by white space, the, the, the one that we find, the second one, argv1. And this, this is the third one, so this will be an argv2. So no, we, we're using zero-based indexing, so for an arg argument count of three, we expect to have arguments in um, argv0, argv1, and argv2. And these, um, so I know this gets a little bit complicated because it's a, it's a care point, pointer pointer, but really all you have to understand is you can kind of treat argv then as um, an array of character pointers. So it's, it's an array of, um, of old style, the, the way that we used to work with strings in C, just as an array of, of regular characters, okay? And that's what you get, right? So um, since, since this is an array of characters, we need to actually um, convert it into an integer. So we can use uh, a C library function called ASCII to integer to do this. Um, so when, when, when you're working with old style C strings, so arrays of characters, sorry, old style character arrays, uh, you usually use old style um, C library functions like ASCII to int or ASCII to F, A2F for ASCII to float or things like that. To, to do simple conversions like this. So, so this will change that from the array of characters into an integer, so 100 in my case. And the second is, I mean, I normally use C++ strings to represent strings because they're much more powerful than using arrays of characters, but since we've now got an array of character for the file name, I need to convert that into a string. So, so calling that array of characters and instantiating a string object with that array of characters will give me a C++ string with the file name, um, okay. and then we continue on. So then from there on, so this is what will, what will normally happen for all these, the simulations that we build for this class. So we'll usually call like one or two things. You know, so we'll first start off by just loading the program. And in this case, we load the program that was indicated in the argv2, right? And then there's some extra error checking here. So, you know, if you, I, I, I wrote the load program for you, which I'll probably usually do. But you know, if, if that's a bad file name, um, this won't actually return. It will just immediately exit. So, you know, we, we can look at the load program real quickly just to understand it. So, for example, the very first thing we do in load program um, is we try and open a um, input file stream on the name of the program that you gave us. And basically, if, it, if after you try and open that file stream, input file stream, um, it's not open, that means that um, that file is, is bad. Um, so, so you gave either an incorrect file name or something. In that case, again, we throw an exception, right? So here we try that, and then we catch the exception, um, and then we print out the, the, that we that the simulation run resulted in a runtime error, and we print out the exception message, which is passed um, in all of our simulator exceptions as this message here, right? So I can show that, you know, so if we run sim, but I give a, a bad file name, like bogus.sim, which doesn't exist, 
we'll, we'll end up throwing that exception from the load program that cannot open program file, and then we give the name of the file we were trying to open there um, in our in our message here. So, right? Otherwise, it'll open the file. It will it will expect it to be in exactly that format. Um, And this is the way pretty much like all the load programs basically work. You know, we don't do a lot of error checking, but we, we expect the, the input or the starting state for simulation to be exactly um, as we uh, lay it out, right? So we, we read the first line. This is just reading in things line by line. So we expect that the very first line to have two things. And, and so when you do it like this, it's going to separate by white space again. So it's going to put uh, PC into the key. Um, and since we stream the second thing into an integer, it's going to do the conversion for us. It's one of the nice things of using file streams instead of using low-level C I/O. So, so here it converts automatically from a string that we read in into an integer. Um, and yeah, if we don't exactly get that, or, or, or if an error is generated, we'll just throw an exception. You know, that we didn't see the program counter as the first line, right? And so on. So we expect the next two values to be uh, AC and then another integer. And then the next line should have three values, which is, you know, and it should, the, the first one should be mem, and then, you know, two values, which are the base and the bounds address, which we use to initialize memory with. Uh, and then everything else represents the contents of memory. So we expect some number of lines, um, and we just keep reading until we run out of lines. And every line after that should have two things, which is the address of memory, and then the value of that initial, um, you know, initially in that memory address, you know, and then we're going to be um, basically don't worry about this pushback. We're going to be poking those in. So every time we read in an address and a value, we poke that value into our simulated memory um, at that address, right? And so that's how we load um, a program here. Okay? But again, I, oops, um, I wanted to kind of show that, you know, so back to the, uh, the main function here. Um, uh, and then, you know, after we load the program, then we just call run simulation. So if load program succeeds without an exception being thrown, then we're safe to try and run the simulation. So that was, again, that was the thing that you, I gave run simulation to you on this assignment. I might not do that for all the assignments, but uh, that was the thing that used your fetch and execute functions that you implemented to simulate a fetch execute cycle uh, here, okay? All right, so yeah, I think that was all that I wanted to um, kind of go over here about uh, the, the program one and the test one. Um, so yeah, as usual, um, probably uh, starting, certainly starting next Monday, we'll start, I'll start kind of talking about the second um, program assignment. Uh, I'll probably start with the, the, the second problem set um, and, and maybe talk about what our second unit, unit here is about, which is about processes and threads. Um, and what the concept of a process, you know, how that's implemented in operating systems and what it does for operating systems. So that's kind of the whole purpose of our next three week unit here, unit two. So. All right. Um, yep. Yeah, with that, I will go ahead and end it. Um, as usual, um, you know, if you have questions, feel free to email me while you're working on things anytime. Um, um, and you know, I can answer by email or we can set up um, Zoom sessions or whatever. So. Um, okay, that's it for this session. I will see you guys uh, next time.